Is it fair to say that kidney stones are more painful than giving birth? Well, maybe. Because kidney stones often make the list of one of the most painful conditions that a human can experience. So today, we're going to talk about what kidney stones are, what causes them, how to treat and reduce your risk of getting them, and why they're so painful, and if it's fair to compare them to childbirth. It's going to be a stony one. So let's jump into this anatomical awesomeness. So first let's start with some basic functions of the kidneys so that we can better understand kidney stones. These bean-shaped organs, which you can see right here on the tray, are little powerhouses. Each kidney is about the size of your fist and sits on both sides of the spine spanning from about T12 to L3, with the right kidney being a little bit lower due to the liver. Now if you take a look at this kidney, you can see that we've cut it in half in the frontal plane so that we can take a look inside. Now, if you take a look at this outer portion that I'm tracing with the probe, this is referred to as the renal cortex. And the cortex is where the magic happens. Because if we were to zoom in to the cortex, you would see about a million of these incredible filtration units called nephrons that function to filter your blood and produce your urine. And I should actually be a little bit more accurate for you anatomy and physiology nerds out there because the cortex contains the majority of those million nephrons with other nephrons extending deeper into the renal medulla that I'll talk about in a little while. Now the nephrons again are about filtering the blood and even reabsorbing some substances that we may want to hold on to depending on the current state of the body. But think about how crazy this is. Your kidneys filter almost 50 gallons or about 190 liters every single day. Now obviously you don't have 50 gallons of blood inside of you, so your blood is being cycled through multiple times throughout the day. And through that process, you usually produce about one to two liters of urine per day. And again, what your kidneys are trying to do is get rid of waste products. So you can see if your kidneys are not working properly, you can get a buildup of waste products in the body and that can cause multiple problems. But filtration isn't the only function that the kidneys perform. The kidneys are also key players in regulating your body's fluid balance, holding onto more water when you're dehydrated and excreting excess water if you're overhydrated. They also help control blood pressure by releasing hormones like renin, which kicks off a series of reactions that can constrict blood vessels when needed. They also produce erythropoietin or EPO, which is a hormone that stimulates red blood cell production in the bone marrow. And let's not forget their role in bone health. The kidneys activate vitamin D, which helps your body absorb calcium from food. Now, because blood is constantly moving through the kidneys, that means urine is constantly being produced. And as the urine is produced through this process of filtration, it is going to be collected in structures within the central portion of the kidney called the renal medulla. And some of these structures within the renal medulla will be important for the formation of kidney stones. And if you take a closer look at this kidney, you can see these pyramid-shaped structures called renal pyramids. And if we were to zoom into these renal pyramids, we would see that they are made up of tiny collecting tubules, which are going to collect the urine. And then those collecting tubules will funnel that urine into these calyces, which will then funnel the urine into this expanded cavity called the renal pelvis. And the renal pelvis essentially becomes the ureter, which will take the urine down to the bladder. And the bladder is quite the convenient storage organ for urine. And sometimes everyone, I don't think we give the bladder all the credit it deserves. Because remember, we produce urine 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so if you didn't have a bladder, you'd be piddling your pants 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Hey, look everybody, Billy peed his pants. Of course I peed my pants. Everybody my age pees their pants, it's the coolest. But luckily you can store it in the bladder. And when you're ready, you relax your external urethral sphincter, let the urine pass through the urethra, and hopefully make it into the toilet. So how do kidney stones actually form? Kidney stones, also known as renal calculi, are essentially hard deposits that form when certain substances in your urine become too concentrated and start to crystallize. Now urine is basically a solution of water mixed with waste products, salts, and minerals like calcium, oxalate, uric acid, and phosphate. In a healthy scenario, there's enough fluid to keep these substances dissolved so that they can flush out of the body harmlessly. But if you're dehydrated or have an imbalance, those minerals can clump together. Like imagine if you had a glass of water 
and you started dumping some type of salt into that water, and we'll call that salt calcium oxalate. Initially, the water would dissolve this salt, but if you continued to add more and more salt, eventually you would exceed the capacity of the water to dissolve that higher amount of salt, essentially supersaturating that solution, and then the salt would start to precipitate out, or in other words, would start to clump together and form crystals or stones. And so you can apply this idea to kidney stone formation. If you don't have enough water moving through the tubules of the kidneys and or too much salt or minerals, those salts and minerals can start to clump together and form a stone. So water intake is one of the most important risk factors that you can control to reduce your risk of developing kidney stones. But other things that influence the risk of developing a kidney stone are diet, supplements, the pH of the urine, as well as genetics. And so let's quickly mention the different types of kidney stones. The most common type of stone, making up about 80% of cases, are calcium stones, usually calcium oxalate. Oxalate comes from foods like spinach, nuts, chocolate, and even some teas, but your body also produces it naturally. High calcium levels in urine can come together with oxalate and form these calcium oxalate stones. There are also uric acid stones, which tend to form in acidic urine and are linked to diets high in animal proteins, as well as a condition known as gout, where people form uric acid crystals in their joints and tend to also excrete more of it in the urine. Struvite stones are associated with urinary tract infections, as bacteria like Proteus can make urine more alkaline, leading to these larger branching stones. And finally, cysteine stones, which are more rare and are caused by a genetic disorder where the kidneys excrete too much of the amino acid cysteine. So due to there being different types of stones, it can be helpful to know which stone someone actually has. And if I have a patient that has a known or suspected kidney stone, I'll actually give them a filter to urinate through in order to catch the stone. Because knowing the type of stone can help someone to reduce their risk of developing another stone in the future. Like with the uric acid stones, we learned that those tend to form in a lower pH of urine and with higher intake of animal proteins. So dietary modifications could help reduce the risk. And of course, with all of the stones, plenty of fluid intake is important, starting with about two to three liters per day. So finally, why do kidney stones hurt so bad? I actually just had a patient the other day with a stone and this guy was not happy. He couldn't sit still or get comfortable and was just in a ton of pain. But is it fair to compare kidney stone pain to the pain a female experiences while giving birth? Well, let's first start by going over the anatomy of kidney stone pain. The stones can actually form up in the collecting tubules that we learned about earlier, or even in the calyces, or even down in the renal pelvis. But this is where size truly matters. If you were to have a stone that was deformed and it was smaller than the diameter of the ureter, it might pass right outside the body without you really even noticing it. But if the stone is larger than the ureter, like this real kidney stone that we have here, that is where we're going to start dealing with some pain. The ureters are about three to four millimeters in diameter. And so anything larger than that is again going to cause pain. The pain is known as renal colic. And this comes from the stone blocking the flow of urine. Imagine a traffic jam in a tiny pipe and urine backs up behind the stone and this can cause the kidney and the ureter to stretch and distend. This stretching triggers intense spasms in the smooth muscle that's within the actual ureter because that smooth muscle is going to try to push the stone along. And that pain usually starts in the back or on the side, just below the ribs, and can radiate to your lower abdomen, groin, or even genitals as the stone moves downward. It often comes in waves lasting 20 to 60 minutes and might be accompanied by nausea, vomiting, or even blood in the urine from the stone scraping down the ureter's lining. If the stone is really stuck, it can lead to hydronephrosis, where the kidney swells from backed up urine, adding even more pressure and pain. And if there's an infection involved, like with struvite stones, you might get fever and chills, turning a bad situation into a potential emergency. Most stones under five millimeters pass on their own. And so most patients can be treated with ibuprofen to manage the pain, and sometimes even a medication like tamsulosin, which is a medication that helps relax the smooth muscle within the ureter to help facilitate passage. And this is especially used for stones that are five to 10 millimeters. And for even bigger stones, 
there may need to be more aggressive interventions such as extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, or ESWL, which uses sound waves to break the stone into tiny pieces that can pass. If that doesn't work, ureteroscopy involves threading a thin scope up the urethra and bladder into the ureter to grab the stone with a basket or blasting it with a laser. For very large stones over two centimeters, percutaneous nephrolithotomy might be needed, which is when a small incision is made in your back to access the kidney directly and remove the fragments. But does this compare to pain of giving birth? Well, both are very painful, but pain is quite subjective and can vary greatly from person to person. Now, I have talked to females that have experienced both, and some have said that the kidney stone was worse, others have said giving birth was worse. But let's let the comedian Jeff Foxworthy settle this debate. Fact of life, you do not want a kidney stone. You may want to paint your butt cheeks in honey and sit in a fire ant bed, but you do not want a kidney stone. So. Are, are there women in here tonight? Raise your hand if you've done both. You've had a kidney stone and a baby. You, oh, several. Which one was the pain worse? Kidney stone. Kidney stone. Anybody else? Kidney stone. Anybody? Kidney stone. Anybody else? Baby or kidney stone? Which one was the pain worse? Kidney stone. Nobody says the baby? Oh. No, this lady does. She said the baby. Okay, as defense attorney for the kidney stone, <laughs> this would be my argument. A year or two after having a baby, a woman will say, you know what? I am about ready to have another child. <laughs> you never hear someone go, well, I'm about through crying and puking. I think I'll drink a case of Coca-Cola and see if I can't work up another kidney stone. I'm assuming that most of you watching these videos enjoy learning. And one of my favorite learning platforms that I love to use to help me to continue to brush up on my skills is Brilliant. Like, I've been accused of being a super nerd by my family for using the Brilliant app for fun when I'm just hanging out or even when I'm at an amusement park waiting in line. Like, who wouldn't want to use a fun app while waiting in line? But Brilliant has been a sponsor of ours for many years because Brilliant aligns with our values of learning at any stage in your life with thousands of interactive lessons in math, science, data analysis, and even AI. These lessons are designed to be uniquely effective, as Brilliant's first principles approach builds understanding from the ground up through problem solving and engaging hands-on exploration, all of which are extremely important for not only learning new information, but also retaining it and helping you to become a better thinker so that you can apply your knowledge to real-world situations. And the science nerd in me continues to geek out about Brilliant science courses, as these courses help you to make sense of our universe at every level, from the mechanics of simple machines all the way up to the mind-bending physics of black holes. So if you want to learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org IHA, scan the QR code on screen, or click the link in the description. Brilliant is also giving our viewers 20% off an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. Thanks again to Brilliant for supporting the channel, and thank you to all of you for watching our content about the human body. And of course, we'll see you in the next video.